Um, I, you know, since we're talking about the bigger picture and I'm here as an anthropologist, I thought I would begin at the very beginning with where do babies come from? Um, this next image is uh, from a, a, what it advertises itself as a 21st century children's book. What makes a baby? Notice not who makes a baby, but what makes a baby? Published in 2012 by Corey Silverberg. I have to give a hat tip to Haberdian Hecate. So I'm sure some of you know her on Spinster. She, she found me the, the title. I just found the image on the internet. So there's these kind of schmoo creatures, um, super smiley and inclusive and modern. And the text says, when grownups want to make a baby, they need to get an egg from one body and sperm from another body. They also need a place where the baby can grow. <laughs> and I would say this is a wonderful example of a logical fallacy one often sees in context of contemporary discussions of gender identity, surrogacy, and prostitution, which is the famous post hoc ergo proctor hoc. After this, therefore, because of this, since the expansion of surrogacy, transactivism, and sex work as work discourses have come after feminist and lesbian, gay, and bisexual rights movements, the idea is that they're a consequence of those prior movements. And not only that, they're an improvement on those prior movements. They're a result, they're a result and enhancement. And you can tell because, of course, the more later, the more progressive. Thus, logically, a 21st century children's book is self evidently more progressive. Or than whatever came before. <clears throat> of course, we're, you know, those of us here know that the erasure of mothers portrayed in this groovy 21st century text is nothing new. So I, I picked an image here that could come from many, many religious traditions where there's a, a ritual of second birth and you have a, a, a man-made birthing vessel and you, and, the, and you produce the baby out of it. It goes in as like a dirty little heathen and it comes out as a, as a real acknowledged person with a name and it's, and it's so clean, it's smiley. Look how clean the baby is when it came out of the male procreative vessel. Male authority figures do the real work of birthing socially valid people. Now, a contemporary secular version of this would be the notion of the university as an alma mater. So your flesh mother birthed your carnal self, but this the patriarchal institution of the university is the mother of your higher educated, socially valid, eternal soul. So this isn't just something Western or associated only with Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Um, it appears over and over again in the human record. So here I'm quoting from a wonderful essay published in 1981 by two male anthropologists, Maurice Block and Stephen Guggenheim, uh, Compadrasco, Baptism and the Symbolism of a Second Birth. So they say, they, they discuss in this article, the symbolic allocation to those in authority of the power to create people as legitimate members of society based on the replacement of dirty natural birth by clean legitimate second birth. It is no accident that we find similar symbolic arrangements about cleanness and dirt, and above all, about sex, gender, and birth in totally unrelated societies. So over and over again, one sees this idea that women on their own don't create real people. So the baby that comes out of just a woman might be a bastard if it's, unrec if it's not socially recognized by its father. So that it's a person who can't belong to a family group, who can't inherit family property. It comes out of a slave woman and might hardly be a person at all, just has the status of slave. Um, so, or in other cultures, the process of turning a child into a real social person might happen later on in life. So there's very common symbolism in male initiation rituals in many cultures, for example, where you go into a dark space as a kind of formless being, you emerge often through a narrow aperture as a man, a full social person. Sometimes you might be covered in red body paint, your body might be in size to produce blood, like the, the symbolism of like, this is a birth, this is a better birth, um, is, is very, very evident in many of these kinds of rituals. So of course, not all societies have these, <clears throat> not all societies that do have initiation rituals of this type or baptismal rituals of 
of the first type that I talked about. Not all of them are extremely hierarchical. I don't want to overemphasize the universality of this. But I, I, I will say these kinds of um, ritual performances, ritual processes are extremely widespread in the world anthropological record. Of course, at the same time, everyone can see that the unbaptized baby is a real baby, that the bastard baby is a real baby, that the uninitiated young person is a real young person. It takes quite a lot of ideological and political effort to insist that the biological mother did not produce uh, a new real person. So just another example, um, Fanny Kimball was an English actress who married uh, an American plantation owner from the US South. She spent a year on his plantation in 1838 to 1839, and she kept a journal of her horrified time there. The, the marriage was not a success. Um, and one of the things she mentions is that everyone can name the slaves fathered by the plantation owner on other plantations, but never <laughs> on the plantation that they are uh, part of the owning family. Now, um, this is to say that these biological facts always coexist with cultural fabulation about biological facts. The biological facts on their own don't blow the whole thing sky high. So the fact that everyone could name um, the, the children of plantation owners on other plantations, the fact that slave women, of course, whether the fathers of their children were plantation owners or other slaves, they knew their babies were real babies. The fact that everybody is aware of the biological facts does not blow the cultural system sky high on its own. And I mention this because in our activism, I think we would do well to keep this in mind. The idea that once people know what's happening about gender identity or prostitution or surrogacy, once they know, they'll be on our side. I, I think if you look at the world historical record, this is a pretty slender read on which to hang our hopes. Okay. Now, going back to the, the second birth uh, uh, symbolism, some might object that the appropriation of birth imagery is merely metaphorical. Probably no one here, but I'm just imagining a hostile larger audience. As creatures driven by meaning, it's not surprising that human beings take one of the key biological facts of life and use it as a symbolic vehicle for expressing various cultural ideas about belonging. There's no need to gin up an enormous conspiracy about women's oppression out of it. Like, come on, feminist lady. Okay, I'm just gonna say, just bear with me. Uh, there is a pattern here. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna be drawing on uh, Gerda Lerner's book, Through Creation of Patriarchy, published in 1986. Some of you have probably read it. Um, you'll notice as an aside that my references are rather out of date. I promise you that I've read more recent literature and anthropology than this stuff published in the 1980s, but contemporary feminist anthropology has strangely lost interest in pursuing these lines of inquiry, although I'm hopeful that the tide is going to turn again in my lifetime. Okay, Lerner examined the history of some of the earliest human empires from which we have written records in Mesopotamia, the territory of present-day Iraq, starting about 5,000 years ago. And here's some of the things she noticed about these earliest empires and their development. So she notices the rise of ideologies of male procreativity and the disappearance or downgrading of female goddesses and maternal religious iconography. She notes this, you, should, you see this in concert with what Lerner calls the invention of slavery. So at first, male war captives were usually killed. When male war captives are kept, they're, they're mutilated. Typically blinding is a, very, is a very common form of mutilation when you keep male war captives, but more usually you kill them. And this is because when you're not yet a really well-organized imperial state, it's dangerous to keep male war captives around. They might fight back. Female war captives are more often kept around. Female slaves, a class that she says you can see emerging from the practice of keeping war captives, appear in the historical record before male slaves and in greater numbers. So she says, look, there's a honing of this invention of slavery with the emergence of a permanent slave class. Children born to slave women are not real people because all women have been ideologically stripped of the power to confer humanity to their children. 
elite men have appropriated this power. So you see all these ideologies, religious ideologies of male procreativity, and they don't use this power that they've appropriated to recognize the children of slave women. Those, those people are not real people at all. They can be treated any way you want. Okay, so she, she says, you see these transformations accompanied with the rise of these early empires by the emergence of large scale commercial prostitution regulated by the imperial state. So she has various pieces of evidence she, she, she describes for this, but one piece would be the appearance in legal codes of rules around uh, harlots being legally forbidden to wear veils. Veils are the mark of the respectable woman and the respectable woman is a woman attached to and recognized by a man. So a father, a husband, or perhaps a brother. Now, there are enough similar examples and I'm not gonna go through other examples, but there are enough similar examples cross-culturally and across historical time to suggest at the very least a strong correlation between empire and intense reproductive and sexual exploitation of women. So you see, one, an ideology that generative procreative power comes from male elites, not women. Two, it costs these male elites nothing to give less elite males power over an especially sexually subjugated class of women, often in the form of prostitutes. This is a way to get buy-in from these less elite males as imperial empires solidify, imperial hierarchy solidify, the status of these less elite males sinks in some ways relative to more elite males, but it rises in this other way relative to this subjugated class of women. Finally, the threat of ending up like those entirely subjugated women enforces compliance in all other classes of women. What we're seeing today with the fluorescence of surrogacy and prostitution as practices that treat women as vehicles for male self-realization is the same old, same very old. The erasure of women by elite men in transactivism is similarly old fashioned. It feels new because of social media and weird biotech stuff like uterine transplantation, which currently has been pioneered just between women with the assistance of a lot of immunosuppressive drugs. It's actually very scary kind of surgery. The idea is someday in the future, we might be able to transplant uteruses into men, I think, it's be a very dis distant future, if ever. But anyway, the point really is entities like the World Professional Association for Transgender Health use this kind of futuristic imagery and rhetoric on purpose. So this is their recent virtual symposium and they have this kind of really Star Trek-y uh, iconography associated with it. And it's to reinforce this idea that more later equals more progressive that, that I started with. Okay. Why are we seeing this now? Why are we seeing this sort of furious uh, proliferation of stuff? Like why are so many turfs also swerfs? And why, why do these things seem to go together? Why, do they, why are they in association this gender identity stuff and this prostitution stuff and this surrogacy stuff? Why is it all happening now? And I'll explain in the next few slides why I picked this Empire Strikes Back imagery. Now, Conservative commentators often look at the gender identity stuff in isolation and see in it a sign of imperial decline. They invoke figures like the Roman Emperor Caligula, or at least Caligula as played by John Hurt in the I Claudius television series, and they prophesy a new end of the West. This is like the decline and fall. And, and I would say, God, if only. Um, I have my doubts about this. They, the conservative commentators will say we're entering a new dark ages, which like if that were happening, it might not be so bad. The dark ages were comparatively not terrible for ordinary people. The Roman economy was a slave economy after all and the collapse of that slave economy with the end of the Roman empire was not terrible for ordinary jerks. Um, so we'll also hear from conservative commentators that, that it's the decline of the West, that China is the new hegemon, I mean, I, I, at my age, I have, I have my doubts. We've heard that the West was gonna collapse in the face of the Soviets. So this, um, this is a joke that will only work for certain middle-aged North Americans, but, but that uh, movie Red Dawn, and what was it, Red Dawn, where the Russians invaded the American heartline, heartland and like teen, American teenagers had to stand up and they're like, Wolverines, it's a small joke. Um, or like Japan for a while was supposed to eclipse the West or like maybe it was gonna be Islamic terrorism. Maybe now it's China, I don't know, M maybe. But here's what it looks like to me. 
I think it looks a lot like imperial retrenchment. If you don't think in terms of a particular world region, but in terms of absolute military spending, the entire globe is becoming more, not less, imperialized. There was definitely a post-Cold War dip. There was this brief promise of a new age, but it didn't last long. Um, military spending around the world is still disproportionately US military spending, as you can see in this chart. Um, and we should never forget that the internet, which plays such a huge role in many of the processes we are, are up against, grew out of the DARPANET, the Advanced Research Project Agency Network of the US Defense Communications Agency, which now is called itself the Defense Information Systems Agency. And you can see its, it's, it's vision of what its role in the world is really subtle, right, with <laughs> this imagery. Um, Silicon Valley has been connected to the US military from the very start. If you look at trends in global inequality, it looks like elites are doing okay in much the way imperial elites always do okay. Okay, so progress and anti-progress. As all of us know, something weird has been happening on the so-called left for a while now. It used to be anti-war, now it hardly seems to care. There's essentially no anti-war critique of militarism except at its fringes. It used to care about class. Now it's obsessed with ever more fragmentary forms of identity. It used to find corporations suspect. Now it urges the Silicon Valley ones to regulate free expression. It used to want to smash the state. Now it wants gender identity legislation passed and sex work legalized, which is to say organized and administered by a state bureaucracy, just like in old Sumerian times. It wants publicly funded and publicly administered full surrogacy now, to quote an appalling recent book title by a supposed feminist. Finally, the left used to be at least a little bit feminist. Now it is aggressively misogynist. 2020 is certainly more later than say 1980, but it is not more progressive. Being in a state of imperial decline, a lament only heard in the affluent West anyway, because what is happening is the imperial elite is becoming more globally distributed, would be preferable to what I think is actually happening. What is actually happening is a ferocious expansion of militarized imperial power. What is it accompanying it is what always accompanies it, an ideology that says women have nothing to do with the real creation of real human beings, male elites are the real gender appropriators, and what also goes along with it is the systematic institutionalization of the sexual exploitation of women. <laughs> Okay, now what is to be done? I'm gonna stop sharing here because this last is just text heavy. So let me just end by reading the text. In terms of what is to be done, I would say the women's human rights campaign is doing it. The most inspiring thing about the WHRC is in my view, it's internationalism and it's intergenerationalism. We see the same things everywhere and across time. We really are in it together. What we're up against is worldwide in scope. It's also ancient in its form. Now I'm not suggesting that there's a continuous line from the Sumerians to the Americans, or there's some immortal race of patriarchs who are in the room who are like, ha ha, get them boys. What I'm saying is empires do the same things over and over again because these practices work, because these practices give them power. So this is big and this is old. We have to ally with one another to take it on. We have to be clear about what we're up against. It really has eaten brave, kind, and clever women just like us. It's eaten them alive for thousands of years. But the good news is it's only done so with the expenditure of great effort. It takes a huge amount of ideological and actual work to sustain this vicious nonsense. We might not be the lucky women to finally jujitsu the imperial juggernaut to get it to collapse from its own ridiculous overreach. But then again, we might. So let's keep going. Let's find out. All right, that's it from me. Thank you so much.